Okay, so I'm here today to talk to you about the Parker Solar Probe. Um, the reason I, so Brian asked me to give one of these talks, he said, you know, what date do you want? And I tried to take the very last date in the, in the series because this launch is coming up this summer. Uh, so slated for August, well, really July 31st at 4 in the morning or something, this thing is supposed to take off. Uh, so it's coming up really soon and it's a good time to, to kind of get excited about it and, and learn what we can. Um, so these first three slides are from a presentation I gave on the sun to my daughter's kindergarten class. <laughs> so you can all stick with me for the first three, I'm sure. <laughs> so when we think of the sun, this is often what we think of, right? This is what the sun more or less looks like from Earth, sitting on the ground as a human being. Um, it looks like a steady thing, you know, the sun will rise tomorrow. It, it looks... Um, like something that is not changing in time, that's something that is, is constant. But if you have the ability to see the sun closer, perhaps in different wavelengths or in more detail, what you see, and maybe you have access to a space telescope, is instead of seeing something like this, you see something like this. This is the exact same sun. <laughs> you wouldn't know it though. Look at all the activity. Um, you've got these, these sort of bands of active regions. You get these sort of coronal arcs. You get um, the surface of the sun changing on all time scales, at all spatial scales. Um, and this is from the, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, SDO, I should say that. And it jumps around a little bit because when the, the SDO has to sort of realign occasionally. Um, but what you can see here is a tremendous amount of detail, right? There's a lot more going on than just the sun will rise tomorrow, right? The, the sun is a very dynamic um, structure that again changes on all time scales, on many spatial scales, and what happens on the sun ultimately affects what happens on Earth. Um, so that's one of the motivations for, for trying to understand it better. Another reason for trying to understand it better is it's just amazing physics. <laughs> I mean, it's just absolutely incredible to, to imagine the scale of what's happening here. You know, if you put the Earth on here, the Earth is sort of this size. And here are structures, you know, that are changing over our time scales that are on scales very, very much larger than Earth. Okay, so that's as far as I got with the kindergartners. So we will go a little more in depth with you folks. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about plasma. So if you're not familiar with what a plasma is, we'll just give you a quick background on that. Magnetic fields and how plasmas and magnetic fields interact. And then we'll get into the solar wind, so you have a, a context of what the solar wind is and why we want to measure it, what are the structures that are out there. And then I capitalized big questions because these are the questions that motivate the Parker Solar Probe. You know, why do we want to fly this thing? Why are we spending, as a nation I suppose, spending close to a billion dollars to get this thing uh, to the sun? And then I'll talk a little bit about the mission concepts, so how the mission will operate and, and specifically the spacecraft. And then this is the fun part, I think. <laughs> is uh, spacecraft survival. I mean, the environment that the spacecraft will be in is, is extremely challenging, um, both for temperature reasons, radiation reasons, the, the velocity of the thing is incredibly fast. Uh, so we'll go through that stuff. And then I've got some pictures <laughs> of the spacecraft itself during uh, integration and test. So to start things out, if you're not familiar, and I don't know why most of you would be, uh, a plasma is a gas that gets so hot that the electrons and the ions separate and stay separated. <coughs> so if you think of an atom, right? An atom is a bunch of protons and neutrons and it's got some electrons whizzing around it more or less um, in a probability cloud, I guess. But if you get it hot enough, those electrons will leave. And if you keep it hot enough, those electrons will not come back. And you'll end up with two fluids. You'll have an ion fluid and an electron fluid. And so some common plasmas, obviously the sun, right? That's a plasma we see every day. Uh, lightning generates plasma when you see these lightning strikes. Neon signs and even fluorescent light bulbs are plasmas. You're driving a current through a gas and you're using that current to kick the electrons off. And when the electrons recombine with those ions, that gives off light. So you see plasmas every day, whether you know it or not. And then things like TIG welders and plasma cutters are also common uh, plasma devices. Like I said, it's a gas and you, you sort of rip it apart into two different gases. So you have an electron gas and an ion gas. And those gases can behave with normal fluid motions, things you think of like waves on the ocean or sound waves. You get those kind of motions, but you also get electromagnetic motions. 
because those are charged particles now that you've ripped apart. So there's electric and magnetic fields that can move them around. So now you have all the regular fluid motions plus all the electromagnetic motions and every combination of those you can imagine. So, so you can get sort of like sound waves or compressive waves. You can get sort of oscillating waves. Um, and you can get those both in an electromagnetic sense and a fluid sense and then combine them every which way and that's what a plasma can do. <laughs> so there's many, many, many degrees of freedom compared to even a, just a gas. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about magnetic fields. So the simplest magnetic field you probably have encountered is a dipole. This is something like a fridge magnet. It has a north and a south. And it, what's happened in this case is somebody has taken some iron filings. So you've taken some iron and ground it down into very fine pieces and then dropped it next to the, the magnet. And because those iron filings can become magnetized, they end up um, aligning with the local magnetic field. So that's a way to visualize the magnetic field is to drop something like iron filings near a, near a magnet. Um, something else about plasmas is because they are charged particles, they're electrons and ions, they interact electromagnetically with a magnetic field. And the way they interact is, is this sort of helix shape. Um, what they're allowed, there's a, quite a bit of math behind this I'm not going to get into, but charged particles will spiral about a magnetic field line. They're constrained, basically trapped to, to spiral, but they're allowed to move along a magnetic field line with no uh, um, there's really no acceleration unless there's some other force present. So they're, they're free to move this way, but they're constrained to move this way. So what that means is that plasmas will trace out magnetic field lines. So very similar to the way the iron filings trace out these magnetic field lines, when you saw those structures on the sun, the big coronal loops, what you're actually seeing is light you know, being radiated from plasmas that are running up and down those field lines, tracing them out in the same way the iron, not the same way, but the same concept as what the iron filings are doing. So the point here is that plasmas trace along magnetic field lines. And why is this important? Well, the sun is a plasma, and the sun has a tremendous magnetic field. This, this idea of having a dipole, which is the simplest magnetic field you can get, a north and a south, well, the sun does that. It has a north and a south magnetic field. The interesting thing about the sun's magnetic field is it changes. It starts north-south, and after Sometime it gets all um, confused and then it pops back to north-south and this happens on an 11 year cycle or south-north rather, it ends up oscillating so every 22 years you end up back with the same magnetic field configuration. But that's sort of a detail from here. So the Sun uh, is a big magnetic field or has a big magnetic field, it's a, it's a ball of plasma. Now parts of that plasma, because the Sun is so hot, actually leave the sun. They're hot enough to overcome the solar gravity and fly out through the solar system. And this is a thing we call the solar wind. This is actually pieces of the sun that are, are, are being expelled. Charged particles, it's, it's plasma again. Okay, so I just made a pretty big claim that pieces of the sun are flying off of it all the time. You know, how do we even know that a solar wind exists? You know, how did, how did people reach this conclusion that this is a, a, a physical process? Well, obviously the answer is up here, right? And it's <laughs> comets were one of the first things that led people to understand that there really is a solar wind. And so some of the questions about a comet that might lead you to wonder if there's something... So we know that comets are on these sort of big orbits, you know, that can pass between the Earth and the Sun or, or even um, at different angles between the Earth and the Sun to make them visible. And when you see a comet in the sky, sometimes you'll see things like this. If you notice, that tail is structured. It's actually broken up into different chunks. And if you look at this tail, there are two tails. So why should a comet tail have structure to it? Why should a comet tail have multiple tails? And more importantly, why do they always point away from the sun? So these are questions that people had about comets you know, hundreds of years back. Um, observations that were, that were made for, for many hundreds of years, but really didn't have an answer. So, around about 1943, which is not that long ago in the scope of understanding the, the solar, or understanding physics and those sort of processes, um, 
a scientist Ludwig, uh, Ludwig Biermann, suggested this idea of a solar corpuscular radiation, meaning something coming off the sun that's not light, something that's a, 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 a gas. And if you assume that something's coming off the sun that is not light, suddenly you can explain the tail structure of comets. So say if that, that gas that's coming off the sun changes in time, maybe some, you know, maybe the density is high now and, and low later, there's some variation in it. That can explain why you might end up with a variation in the, in the uh, comet tail. And it sort of explains why you get a double tail. Not exactly, but it suggests that something else is going on, that you can have a, an interaction of the sun's light with the comet, and you can have an interaction of this gas coming off the sun with the comet. So suddenly you have at least two things that can be acting on the comet, and it's a possibility that they can end up in different directions. And then if you assume that this is coming off the sun, you know, it's coming out sort of in all directions, and it's maybe even causing these comet tails, or related to these comet tails, directing them perhaps, then no matter where the comet goes along its orbit, the tail should always be away from the sun. So this kind of fits with our, with our picture of uh, gas coming off the sun. It sort of answers a number of the questions about comets. Um, that you could. And these kind of pictures, I want to point out, are things you can just see from the ground. You don't need a telescope for this. This is a photograph of a comet that you can see from the ground. Um, so that's part of why these, these questions are so old, or that these are observations that you can make with your, your naked eye. Um, so this is, this is sort of, it's related, I promise. Um, this is a, another example of an observation where something happened on the sun and then something happened on Earth a time later. And by measuring the time delay between when something happened on the sun and when something happened at Earth, the only conclusion you can come to is that whatever was transferring um, energy between the sun and the Earth must be a heck of a lot slower than light. So there must be something else coming off the sun. And so I'll, I'll walk through this. This is um, September 1859. There's an amateur astronomer, Richard Carrington. And you know, amateur, <laughs> he has a private observatory on his country estate. <laughs> so, you know, whatever amateur meant in 1859. Um, and he's observing sunspots. And this is, this is actually an, an image of one of the sketches, sort of hand sketches that he made of these sunspots. And he observes what we now call a white light flare, uh, basically the flash on the sun from this large group of sunspots. And then a few days later, the Earth's magnetic field responds to that. There's, there's observations. This is a, a magnetogram. So there were magnetic field observatories set up all over the Earth, even in 1859. And what was observed at a large number of those observatories was that the magnetic, Earth's magnetic field suddenly changed for a time um, following this event. And what also happened at the same time that magnetic field was changing, or very near when that magnetic field was changing, is that aurora, if you think of aurora, right, the northern lights, the southern lights, this is something you usually, let's even call the northern and southern lights, this is something you think of as being you know, maybe in Norway or Iceland or Canada or something like that. In 1859, the aurora went down to Panama. Yeah. There are ship's logs, you know, of, of, of uh, vessels sailing through near the Panama and the Caribbean islands, and they saw aurora for three days. And in the Rocky Mountains, it was so bright, people thought it was day. Absolutely incredible. And what this, what this is, you know, what these, this aurora um, really is, is, is particles in Earth's magnetic field that are trapped in Earth's magnetic field um, sort of running up into the atmosphere and causing like a, a CRT. Uh, do you guys know cathode ray tube, like the old way televisions are put together? You fire a bunch of electrons at a screen and it kind of gives off light. Well, Earth's atmosphere does the same kind of thing and that, that's what's creating the aurora. But this disturbance in Earth's magnetic field is related to that particle energization, is related to how the aurora were created. But the point is what Carrington was able to do was to connect what happened on the sun with what happened at Earth. And the important part about that, again, is the travel time. Because they knew the speed of light. You know, the speed of light has been known for four or five hundred years. And they knew that if something traveled at the speed of light, it would have connected 
what happened on the sun and what happened on the earth much, much, much faster than this. So there had to be something else that was coming off the sun. And I, I just like sharing this one because it's a, you know, kind of a local thing. It's from the Rocky Mountain News, uh, which I think doesn't exist anymore, but it did a few years ago. Um, but this is a, a description of what happened during that, that uh, large, what we call a geomagnetic storm. Basically, when something on the sun disturbs, or, or something traveling off the sun uh, disturbs Earth's magnetic field. And, and I'm going to read it just because I, I really like this quote. But it says, on the, on the night of September 1st, we were high up in the Rocky Mountains, sleeping in the open air. A little after midnight, we were awakened by the auroral light, so bright that one could easily read common print. Some of the party thought it was daylight and began preparation of breakfast. <laughs> so this is the, the September 17th edition of the Rocky Mountain News from 1859. Um, right, and this, this is almost right after the Rocky Mountain News started to be uh, published. But if it, anyway, just to imagine uh, that kind of effect that the sun makes on Earth. Okay, and so let's jump forward a little bit later. So. Now we have this knowledge that something is traveling off of the sun. The sun is releasing something other than light. And then we know the sun has a magnetic field. So where do we go from there? Um, in 1958, Eugene Parker. So you'll notice the name. You know, no coincidence with the Parker Solar Probe. He sat down and he comes up with the idea that, okay, well, let's start with what we know. We know that the solar, uh, the, the sun has an atmosphere. Let's assume it's a gas. We'll say it's hot and dense, close to the sun, and we know that space is cool and sparse, far from the sun. So if we know those two things, and then we know some basic gas physics, like the ideal gas law, and mass conservation, momentum conservation, suddenly he put together this set of equations uh, that relates these things and the solar gravity. So you get solar gravity, this is how hot the gas is, um, and this is sort of the acceleration of that gas as it leaves the surface of the sun. And what he determined was that if you get particles hot enough, they should be able to escape the sun's gravity and travel out into the solar system. So this is the, the sort of first analytic prediction of a solar wind. And, and this comes down to you know, what temperature does it need to be and what velocity might it come out at. Um, so th that sort of prediction, um, okay, so taking it one step further, the other thing that Parker knew, uh, from about 50 years earlier, he knew that the sun was magnetic and that it had a magnetic field. And so if you know that the sun has a magnetic field and you can make this calculation of how the gas ought to be expanding off the sun, you can make one more prediction that if a piece of gas, a section of gas, leaves the sun here and starts traveling radially outward, and you know it's a plasma because it's so hot the temperature that, that Parker came up with for the, the gas that must be escaping the sun must be so hot that you have a plasma. And we know that plasmas trace magnetic fields. And the other way around actually is to say that magnetic fields hold on to plasmas. It's sort of ambiguous which way that actually goes when you, when you look at the equations. But what he knew is that if a piece of it, a piece of that plasma left the sun here and then the sun rotated and another piece left here and it rotated, and another piece left here, and it, you know, so on and so forth. Those pieces of gas leaving the sun would be connected by a magnetic line. So this is the prediction that Parker made, and what it, what it ends up um, um, creating is this structure. If you imagine the, the magnetic field lines of the sun, if they're traveling along with these gas particles being emitted, the rotation of the sun, acts kind of like a lawn sprinkler. <laughs> and you end up with this structure of, of the gas and magnetic fields that we now call the Parker spiral. And he was right, obviously. <laughs> um, and this is something you can measure at Earth when you or well, out at space near Earth. Uh, you can actually measure that magnetic field configuration that Parker predicted. So more modern ways that we know the solar wind exists you know, so we have these sort of kind of hand-wavy arguments from comets. Um, we have this idea that something on the sun and something on the earth, or something happens on the sun and something later happens on the earth, and the travel time must be fairly slow compared to light. And then we have Parker's analytic predictions. So the next step is to actually measure the solar wind, to put a spacecraft out there and detect these particles in magnetic fields. <laughs> 
the very first measurement of the solar wind, you know, in hindsight, of course, uh, was on Luna 1. This, this thing launched by the, the Soviet Union in 1959. If you'll notice, this thing looks an awful lot like Sputnik. It was basically a follow-on where they tried to, to they tried to uh, use the, the base model of Sputnik that they had already. And the idea was to, to get to the moon, basically to launch something so high that you'd either get into a lunar orbit or a lunar trajectory. They, they didn't make it. <laughs> uh, I mean, they didn't capture into the lunar orbit. Uh, but it had on it a scintillation counter, which measures, um, well, in this case, actually, I'm not sure what, what they were exactly measuring with this one. Um, it had a Geiger counter and a magnetometer, so it had measurements that should have been able to tell that there was the solar wind. Uh, but one of the problems with this mission was that they didn't have any way to hold data on this thing. There was no record function. It, whatever information it recorded, it broadcast immediately. And at the times when it might have been measuring the solar wind for this particular um, uh, launch, the signals were picked up by a ground station in Australia. And Australia is not on friendly terms with the Soviet Union at the time, so the Soviet Union did not want to share how to decrypt the data, and the Australians didn't want to share the data, and so it just sat there. Um, a few years later, you know, the United States launches Mariner 2. This is a mission to Venus. But along the way, it has the ability to measure these low energy ions, so this plasma that uh, the solar wind um, is theoretically composed of and the ability to measure the magnetic fields. And th this is the first direct measurement of a solar wind. And so now you can say that you know, we can measure these, these plasma particles coming off the sun with the temperatures and velocities almost agreeing with what Parker predicted. And we see density variations in there, just like the, the qualitative explanation for why the comet tails are all structured. So that, that was actually the first direct observation of the solar wind, and you'll notice that that's not that long ago. This is a more modern observation of the solar wind. It's a, a movie I'll show you in a second, but I kind of want to explain what's going on here. Uh, so what this is is uh, several cameras on a spacecraft called Stereo. These are white light cameras, or at least these ones are. Uh, in further, I think it might actually be a UV camera. Um, but what they're looking at in these, these outer uh, cameras is they're looking at density fluctuations in the solar wind. So you're looking at sunlight that goes away from the sun and then scatters off of these sort of variations in the electron density. But what you're looking at is that at, because stereo has this array of cameras that look at all different distances from the sun, uh, you could think of this as roughly the solar surface. This is the, the what's called the lower corona or right down close to the sun. This is sort of the the corona, and then out here is what you would consider the solar wind. This is, this is not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. So the, the distances here are much smaller physically than the distances here, even though they're, they're sort of compressed so you can see it all on one graph. This is the orbit of Venus, and this is the orbit of Earth. Now out at Earth, there's a spacecraft there called WIND. And wind was actually made to, to study the solar wind specifically. Um, but wind has a monitor on it that lets it measure the density of the solar wind. But it's, it's this far from Earth <laughs> compared to that far to the sun. OK, so now I got you oriented. Watch this. So I think that's really cool, so I'm just going <laughs> to, but I'll, I'll walk through it to, to explain what's going on. So what you're seeing here is the sort of equatorial region of the sun. That thing that just came off is what's called the coronal mass ejection. Occasionally the sun releases a, a sort of large magnetic field structure that contains a higher density plasma, and that runs out through the solar system, occasionally encountering the planets. That's the kind of structure that led to that extremely bright aurora. The aurora down in Panama where basically the entire atmosphere got electrified. Um, those sort of structures lead to those sort of events. And here's one captured by stereo as it's leaving from all the way from the solar surface. And you can see that density structure move all the way out 
And at the same time, you can watch the density on wind. It pegs high right when the, the coronal mass ejection comes by. Um, this video is sort of incredible for, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, part of it was the signal processing that went into it was very impressive. Um, there was a whole mission called Stereo devoted to, to making these kind of movies. The other thing to watch in this case is look at the scale of this thing. You know, there's that coronal mass ejection. There's the entirety of Earth. These are not small or subtle structures. These are very, very large objects. Um, so this is just a direct observation where we can actually watch the solar wind evolve in time. But what we're looking at here are sort of macro scale. We're looking at the big picture. But what we're missing is some of the smaller scale stuff. And that's, that's kind of where solar probe comes in. So what is solar wind actually made of? Is it ions, but ions of what? Mostly hydrogen, so it's just protons. It's protons and electrons for the most part. There's something like, depending on, on where you're looking at the solar wind, there's something like um, 10 to 20% uh, helium. And then there's very, very small amounts of everything else. So iron, oxygen, you know, everything else you'd, you'd uh, imagine being there. Um, so just to give you a couple more ideas of what the solar wind looks like and ways to think about it, this is again this, this Parker magnetic field model, the Parker spiral or, or the lawn sprinkler, <laughs> which basically says that you know, the, the sun is magnetized and the sun is constantly putting off this, this uh, uh, charged particles and together as the sun rotates that creates this sort of spiral pattern. There's another thing called the heliospheric current sheet and that is the boundary between the north, mag north directed magnetic field, so stuff coming out of the sun, and south directed magnetic field which are sort of field lines coming into the sun. That boundary, even though it exists on the sun because the sun's magnetic field is being carried outward with that plasma, that structure, the, the dividing line between those two magnetic field um, structures, actually propagates out through the entire solar system in this kind of spiral pattern. So you can see the magnetic field um, alternate you know, back and forth between north and south as you pass over that boundary. The other, um, some other important things about the solar wind is it's supersonic very quickly. So very close to the sun it becomes supersonic, meaning that it's flowing away from the sun faster than the speed of sound in that gas. So if you made it, the, basically what that means is that the, the gas can no longer communicate backward to the sun. It can't send information back to the sun. Information can only go the other way. It's also what's known as super alphanic. And so supersonic means you're, going, you're moving faster than a sound wave. Super alphanic means you're moving faster than a wave in the magnetic field. So perturbations in the magnetic field and, and whatever the gas is doing when it gets away from the sun, that information cannot make it back to the sun because you're moving away faster than those waves can propagate back. And these happen at different distances away from the sun. And actually one of the goals of Solar Probe is to find out where this actually happens. What distance from the sun. There's a lot of models, a lot of theories, but nobody's quite sure. Another thing that's really interesting about the solar wind is it actually comes in two flavors comes in what's called a fast solar wind and a slow solar wind. <laughs> the fast solar wind is faster and the slow solar wind is slower. Um, the slow solar wind comes mostly near the equator of the sun. The fast solar wind comes from primarily the poles, but occasionally uh, will end up down near the equator. The fast solar wind models uh, currently suggest that it's accelerated very close to the sun, is sort of where it ramps up to that high speed. And the slow solar wind takes some distance away from the sun to, to ramp up to its full speed. And a lot of predictions say something like 20 solar radii. And it's no mistake that the solar probe mission is designed to get below that distance. Another interesting way to think about the solar wind or visualize it is you have all these magnetic field lines that are rooted. You can imagine them as these, these sort of line structures that are rooted in the sun, but spiraling out through the whole solar system. When you measure those uh, from a spacecraft, what you end up with as a sort of cartoon picture of what's going on is what's called this sort of uh, spaghetti <laughs> diagram. Basically, all these magnetic tubes 
So you remember that plasma can travel along the magnetic fields, but it can't really travel across the magnetic fields very well. And so that's why you end up with this sort of spaghetti-like or tube structure to the, to the solar wind. So it still follows that, that Parker spiral on a large scale, but if you look on a small scale, it's actually this sort of collection of tendrils of magnetic field. Um, so these are, are, this I sort of touched on, uh, this is the, oh, that didn't come out very well. Anyway, this is the sort of cartoon of a coronal mass ejection. That's sort of a, a piece of magnetic field and, and uh, plasma that comes off the sun as a coherent uh, structure. Those are the kind of things that lead to magnetic perturbations on Earth and disturb Earth's magnetic field and cause uh, particles to drop into our atmosphere that then light up the atmosphere as the aurora. There's also these kind of structures, which are called co-rotating interaction regions. That's a, don't worry about that. All you have to think about is that it's the boundary between a fast and a slow solar wind. So if you have a slow solar wind here and a fast solar wind here, the fast solar wind is going to run into the slow solar wind and it's going to make a sort of pressure build up right at that edge. And these sort of things sweep with the rotation rate of the sun, so they come around every 26 days. Um, and when they come around and whack Earth's magnetic field, you can get similar effects, but much weaker to, to what happens with these coronal mass ejections. Okay, so I gave you a grand tour of the solar wind. Um, how are we measuring the solar wind and the sun? Uh, these days, we're doing it using quite a few spacecraft. Um, and we're measuring lots of things. We're measuring solar radiation. So we're measuring everything from the radio waves to the gamma rays. That's the, the, pretty much the whole spectrum. Um, we measure these things called radio bursts, which I probably won't get into in any kind of detail. We measure the magnetic fields, and we measure the particles that come off the sun. Both are, or measure their density, their velocity, how hot they are, what kind of particle they are. And then we make a lot of measurements on Earth related to the Earth's magnetic field and the Earth's atmosphere and ionosphere that are directly impacted by what happens at the sun. And this is sort of the fleet of spacecraft that we're using to do this. But in spite of all that, here we are, 159 years after Carrington, 60 years after Parker figured it all out on paper, and 20 NASA missions to study the solar wind. Yet what don't we understand? What's left? Well, the surprising answer is that there's very fundamental questions about the solar wind still left. What heats it? What accelerates it? Why is it that hot? Uh, as it moves away from the sun. Why does it travel at thousands of kilometers, or up to thousands of kilometers per second, usually a couple hundred kilometers per second? That's still pretty fast. Why is it traveling that fast? What structures on the sun are actually sourcing the solar wind? Because we know that there's a slow wind near the equator, uh, often, and then there's a fast wind near the poles, so what's different about that? What is it about the sun's magnetic field that's causing that? And then this third one is how are solar energetic particles accelerated? So there are particles that come off the sun that are much, much faster than the solar wind. They're traveling very close to the speed of light, even though they're protons or, or electrons. So how do they get accelerated? And these are the questions that Parker Solar Probe will be targeting. So I'll touch on each one just a little bit and then get into a little bit about the spacecraft. Oh, that's the spacecraft. Um, but I'll get into it in more detail. So this first major question, what heats and accelerates the solar wind? So what processes are adding energy to the solar wind? Um, what we do know is that the, the solar surface is something like a few thousand degrees Kelvin. But just off the solar surface, what you call the corona, is a million degrees. So within a few hundred kilometers, the temperature changes dramatically. You know, so there's questions about how that happens. Is there any remnant of that process that we can observe if we get close enough to the sun? There's the fast solar wind and the slow solar wind. Why is there a fast and a slow wind? Um, why is the fast wind accelerated closer to the sun and the slow wind accelerated a little bit further away? There's also a really interesting observation made by, uh, this is from a spacecraft called Helios. And this is, don't worry about the details, what you're looking at is distance away from the sun and sort of the temperature of the solar wind. And this blue line is what you would expect if it were just a gas. Say you took a hot gas and you let it go. You can make a prediction for how much it should cool at a certain distance. That's what this blue line is. This is what the solar wind is doing. It's being heated the whole way along. 
some process in the solar wind is heating it, even as it travels away from the sun, even as it can no longer communicate back to the sun, it's still being heated. What's that process? How does that operate? And to, to measure that, to understand that, um, we're at a point where you really have to measure close to the sun to be able to, to distinguish between different models of how this happens. So what are some solar structures, or what solar structures are the sources of the solar wind? So there's observations, um, like here, where you can see a sort of magnetic plasma structure, and you can watch it evolve in time. And it sort of starts from this nice structured loop, and then it breaks apart into these sort of little filamentary structures. Is that related to the slow, to the slow solar wind? Um, sometimes you see these large structures that disconnect from the sun and then travel outward. Is that part of what forms the solar wind? Is it just by the time you get to Earth, all these structures are so broken up that it just looks like a smooth solar wind, but right up close to the sun, it's sort of fragmented? Well, we don't know unless you get close enough to the sun to measure it. And finally, uh, this idea of a solar energetic particle. These are, are protons, uh, other ions with energies of, of mega electron volts to giga electron volts. Just know that it's, it's an ion traveling close to the speed of light, which is a tremendous amount of energy. The sun can put these things off on occasion. They're associated with solar flares. They're associated with these uh, coronal mass ejections, the sort of pieces of the sun that come off. There are some of these that happen gradually, where they slowly build up to a high flux. There's impulsive ones where they suddenly generate. By the time you get out to Earth and you have a spacecraft measuring these things, the transport effects have kind of smeared out what you're looking at so much you can't really tell what the acceleration mechanism was. So this is something you have to get close to the Earth to measure. And I, I do have a video here that's pretty neat. What you're looking at here is this is a spacecraft um, called SOHO. So it sits at Earth. It's a bunch of different telescopes that look at the sun in a bunch of different wavelengths. So this is you know one telescope on SOHO. This is another. This is another. This is the little stick that holds. This is the, the outer part is what's called a coronagraph, meaning you have to block out part of the sun to be able to observe the weaker features around it. This is just the stick that holds the, the little blocking disk. But this is what SOHO sees when a coronal mass ejection goes, or a solar energetic particle event goes off, pointed toward Earth. It looks like it's snowing. It's obviously not snowing, you're in space. Um, but what you're observing is these extremely high energy particles are ramming into the detector and they're saturating it. They're, they're blinding it on these small locations. And that's what the snow is, is all those high energy particles whacking into SOHO. And so why we care about these things at a more practical level is they'd be extremely dangerous uh, for astronauts, for spacecraft electronics, um, and for spacecraft solar panels. So if you have some way to understand when they might happen, that could be uh, very beneficial. So what's the time scale between the eruption and the snowstorm? <sighs> minutes, hours? Yeah, it's going to be minutes or hours. <laughs> between minutes and hours. So, so to other time scales, light takes eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. The solar wind at a normal velocity takes something like two to three days. So these things are traveling much faster than the solar wind, but still you know, slower than the speed of light. So it's going to be sort of minutes to hours. Okay, so how are we going to do this? We have all these grand goals, all these grand designs to get close to the sun and to measure all these things and to understand a lot about solar physics and how the, the sun creates the solar wind. Um, this is the concept of, of what we arrived at to, to do this. This is the spacecraft bus for Parker Solar Probe and some of the sensors that are on it. The really important stuff, this is the heat shield. <laughs> That keeps you from melting. Um, th these things are radiators. So even though you have a heat shield and you're trying to absorb all the, the heat from the sun with that thing, uh, you really have to put that heat somewhere. You can't just store it in the heat shield. It, it's got to radiate. And so that's what these structures do is allow that heat then to escape to space and cool down the, the heat shield a little bit. You have solar panels. You know, it's a, it's a really funny thing, but Solar panels are extremely difficult when you get close to the sun. <laughs> you'd think you'd have all the light in the world, so you could use this to generate as much power as you like, but the heat is incredible. Much, much hotter than solar panels can typically survive. And in fact, these solar panels, you'll notice they're in two pieces. There's one here, and there's one here. And they actually feather backward when you get close to the sun to try to, and then when you're far from the sun, they feather forward 
And that's to reduce the heat load on them, just because they, they can't take it. Uh, there's a communications antenna, obviously for talking back to Earth, sending the, the data back once it's recorded. And then some of the instruments, things that'll be on here. There's a white light imager. They will not be looking at the sun. <laughs> they will be looking at 90 degrees to the sun. It'll be making images very much like the one I showed you of the structures sort of passing through the solar wind. It'll be looking at the reflected light off the density structures. Um, there are these things, these sticks out here. These are electric field antennas. And yes, they have to be in the sunlight. So they have to survive 2,000 degrees C, which is pretty hot. Um, this thing is a low energy particle sensor. That also has to face the sun and survive those incredible temperatures. Uh, the imager hides in the shadow. There's these low energy particle sensors back here, here and here that have to hide in the shadow. There's high energy particle sensors for looking at the solar energetic particle events. And there's magnetic field sensors that live on this, this uh, boom, this sort of tail that sticks off the back. Um, and they have, to be, they have to be far away from the spacecraft because the spacecraft makes a lot of magnetic fields of its own. And so it's the only way to get an accurate measurement is to move those sensors as far away as you can get them. But you can't move them very far on Solar Probe, otherwise they'd, they'd end up in sunlight. And so how... Sorry, go ahead. The radiators, they just um, radiate for red light. That's how they lose heat. Basically, yeah. But they're kind of just glowing. They, they will glow, yeah. I think they'll get hot enough to glow. And the, there's a heat exchanging fluid that they use to pass. Um, it's not shown on this sort of schematic, but there's, there's actually a heat exchanger. You know, that, that transfers uh, the energy out to the radiators and the heat exchange fluid is water. It's got a water pump. <laughs> so how close will we get to the sun? This is the distance between the Earth and the sun. I'm measuring it in solar radii, which is the, the sort of radius of the sun. If you think of the Earth orbit, Earth is way out here at 215 solar radii. Venus at 155. Mercury at 83, the closest we've ever gotten to the sun, a mission called Helios, uh, put together by West Germany, when West Germany was still West Germany. Um, 65 solar radii. Solar probe is going to 9.8, much closer. <laughs> Especially when you consider that the heat and all, all the other sort of uh, the radiation of the sun goes is like one over r squared. The, the closer you get, all those things go up dramatically. But you see why we have to do that. We have to get that close to the sun to be able to measure where the solar wind is being accelerated and where the energy is being added to, to heat the solar wind and, and how the solar energetic particle events are excited before they get all smeared out by the distance between the Earth and the sun. And this is to scale, actually. I, I, I did make this chart to scale. And the sun is even to scale on that chart. Um, so we're getting very close. The, the easy analogy is that we're going to the two yard line. <laughs> and what will the mission look like? Uh, the idea is to start in 2018, <laughs> here's hoping, and to survive at least until 2025. There's gonna be 24 orbits of the sun the idea is to launch from Earth and head directly on into the Sun, make this orbit, and to sort of um, end up passing through the, the orbit of Venus. And to use Venus to slowly lose angular momentum and allow the spacecraft to get closer and closer to the Sun. Which is a funny thing when you think about it, that you can't shoot something directly into the Sun. You like to think you can, right? Like, oh, let's take all the nuclear waste and fire it straight into the Sun. Well, you can't. Chemical rockets cannot produce enough change in velocity to counteract Earth's angular momentum about the sun. You actually can't shoot something directly into the sun with what we have now. But what you can do is use the planets. So the, the original solar probe concept was to send a spacecraft out to Jupiter all the way out there and then use Jupiter's angular momentum to, or, or exchange angular momentum with Jupiter to allow the spacecraft to fall almost completely into the sun and to skim it basically two solar radii from the surface. But that was deemed infeasible and, and you only get one pass and if you screw it up, well that's that. Um, here, what we're gonna do is use Venus to slowly step in the orbit. And that's why the mission is so long 
Uh, it's because you have to encounter Venus and you can only really encounter it every three orbits. There's a big orbital dynamics problem. Um, so the, the first pass will actually be at 35 solar radii and then every three orbits it walks in further and further. So to make the key scientific measurements we actually have to survive to the very end. And where are we now? Um, we're in final integration and testing. The spacecraft is more or less assembled. Um, it's actually sitting at Cape Canaveral right now getting, uh, fun, again, final integration and testing. And the, the launch window we have is sort of from the 31st of July through August 19th. We'll see if they catch that. Was it built here? The spacecraft? No. Uh, I'll get to what was built here in a moment. So this is kind of the, the awe-inspiring slide for, for an engineering point of view, is that this is what the spacecraft has to survive. The heat shield and the antennas have to get up to, let's go Fahrenheit, 2600 degrees, repeatedly. If you're accurate, if you're, and if you imagine uh, in space, you know, of course there's no reason why the heat shield has to face toward the sun unless you make it. If the sun is here and your spacecraft starts down here and you start to orbit, your heat shield will continue pointing in the same direction and you'll melt. So you have to actively point your spacecraft heat shield all the time. If you're off by more than two degrees, it's done for. But when you, and the other amazing thing, of course, is when you're very close to the sun, that heat shield is wonderful. It's keeping your spacecraft cool and allows you to make measurements. When you're far from the sun, that heat shield is terrible. It's making you very, very cold. So you not only have to survive extreme heat, but you have to survive extreme cold. Some of the sensors, like the electric field antennas, which is part of what we worked on here, have to be in sunlight to operate. So what do you make an antenna out of that can survive 2600 degrees? Um, another thing that's, that's sort of fascinating about the spacecraft is it's going to be moving 180 kilometers per second in the frame of the sun. That is incredibly fast. This will be the fastest human-made object. So the, the previous record is New Horizons, the thing that went out to Pluto. Uh, the maximum velocity that, that New Horizons hit in the frame of the sun was something like 60 kilometers per second. This will be going three times as fast in the frame of the sun. In fact, it'll be going so fast, it'll be an appreciable fraction of the speed of light, like a hundredth or a thousandth or something. And at that, or maybe a thousandth, ten thousandth, that's pretty, anyway. The point is that the clocks on this spacecraft, the clock will run differently than the clock on Earth to a degree that we will notice. You have to resynchronize the clocks every time it comes back around to the slow part of the orbit because it will have traveled, you know, relativistically. That's incredible. Again, I think it's a part in 10,000, but it's still uh, the way that, to the accuracy that we need to measure things, that's a significant fraction. The other thing you have to think about is when you're moving at these incredible velocities, there's a, a cloud of dust near the sun that's, that's orbiting the sun all the time, this sort of F corona. And Imagine what happens when one of those dust particles, even if it's a micron, runs into you when you're moving 180 kilometers per second. It just shreds the thing, punches a hole right through it. And then you worry about this, of course, because you have a, a water cooling system that has water pipes and a pump <laughs> that you really don't want a hole in that. Um, the other thing I already mentioned was these solar arrays. At closest approach, they have to fold back so they don't overheat. But all the way out at Venus, you have to extend them to get enough power to stay alive, to keep yourself warm. And this has to work for 24 orbits in six years. So there's a lot of, of uh, survival challenges for the spacecraft. Uh, the piece that we worked on here is part of the electric and magnetic field instrument suite. I'll go back and point at those things. The electric field measurements are these guys, these long antennas. There's four of them in the plane of the heat shield. There's one little one back here, and there's three magnetometers, one at the end, one here, and one here. And so the CU uh, LASP is part of the team that's building the field's instrument, and our specific contribution is the signal processing board. So we do all the signal processing for the electric and magnetic fields um, for all those sensors that I already pointed out. So we're sampling something like 26 channels at 150 kilosamples, and we're processing the data by uh, transforming it into different coordinates, into different, uh, into a frequency domain. We're 
cutting down the amount of data that comes back by many clever methods. Um, the interesting thing about this is I, I like to call the electronics that we built here artisan electronics. You know, only one of these will ever be built, which is incredible. But it has to operate continuously with no errors, no matter what happens to the spacecraft. And it has to survive, you know, the launch vibrations. It has to survive these radiation and temperature extremes. Uh, so it's it's a, a quite a feat to build one of these things. Okay, and I have pictures. So, oh God, those are fuzzy. Okay, well they look much better here. So come look later if you like. But this is uh, the solar probe spacecraft sitting in integration at APL. So. The uh, Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins, is, uh, that's the team responsible for building the spacecraft bus. So they don't build any of the instruments, they just build the thing that carries the instruments, um, which is just as important. Um, so there's the heat shield, sort of put up on the top, you can see the radiators. Um, you can get a sense of, well, uh, God, this is so fuzzy. Here's a person, so you can get a sense of scale for how big this thing is. Uh, the spacecraft itself, this section of it, which is where all the electronics and everything lives, is probably a, roughly the size of this table up here. And then on top of that is another whole section that just deals with the heat. This is another picture of the spacecraft. This is from uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in one of their big uh, vacuum chambers. So it's all instrumented up uh, such that it's sort of mimicking a flight environment in terms of temperature and uh, vacuum type. Well, they can't reproduce space vacuum, but you can do the best you can on Earth. This, <laughs> so you notice this guy is, is pulling back on this thing and he's about to let it go. Uh, this is a thing called the magnetic swing test, where they dangle the spacecraft, and then you can see the big X drawn on the ground, and then they sort of literally pull it back and let it swing. And the idea is to measure, use that oscillation to measure the magnetic field that the spacecraft produces. And by measuring that, you can understand what errors that will introduce in your measurement of the magnetic field. But the fun picture is a guy pulling back on this spacecraft, getting ready to, to drop it. Um, and this is a picture of them inter integrating the heat shield. So they're actually plopping it down onto the spacecraft uh, at APL. And the other fun picture I have is uh, our rocket. The rocket exists. It's down at the Cape. Um, and they're getting ready to, uh, hopefully sometime soon, start encapsulating the spacecraft and getting ready to, to plop it on top of the rocket. What are the towers on each side? <sighs> Is this just a lightning arrestor? Does anybody know? Yeah, they're lightning. Yeah. Yeah, just so lightning doesn't hit the rocket. That would be bad. So in summary, you know, Parker Solar Probe is an extremely unique mission. Uh, it's a mission that's able to address these sort of big questions that we have about the solar wind and the environment near the sun. It's going to be an extremely challenging environment that the spacecraft has to operate in. Um, so the, the, the structure or the piece of the instrument that we're building, even though it's just signal processing, and it lives in the center of the spacecraft, so it doesn't really get that hot. It gets up to maybe 70 C. We had to design it with the idea that the magnetometer boom, that little tail on the back of the spacecraft, might melt off. <laughs> and so if that leaves the umbra of the heat shield and melts off, our signal processing board has to survive in the event that those, the wires that run out to it melt together or melt apart or you know, whatever ends up happening. So this is the first spacecraft I've worked on where you have to worry about part of it burning away. <laughs> that was absolutely incredible. But this design, you know, uh, is heavily over-engineered, it should survive, and it should meet these science goals. And the exciting point, of course, here is that we're nearly on our way. It's down at the Cape right now, uh, undergoing final integration, and at the end of the summer is when we should be launching. And so at that, I'll open it up. So what's the heat shield made of? It's a carbon foam. Uh, kind of related to what shuttle tiles are. So the, the space shuttle, when it re-enters the atmosphere, it has these sort of carbon foam tiles that live on the bottom uh, that are designed to prevent the, the extreme heat and the plasma, actually, that forms under the space shuttle uh, from getting up into the space shuttle proper. So it's, it's related. 
And how thick are they? Uh, well, let's, let's eyeball it. Um, if this is the size of the table, roughly, then the heat shield is probably about that thick. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah? So you have, you have that one picture where it showed like the magnetic field like in a time lapse on the sun and it kind of looked like it was growing and then at the end, that one right there. Yeah. So it starts off small and gets bigger and bigger and then it looks like it kind of pops at the end. Yeah. Is that the magnetic field line actually bursting? Or so is the, it sending the particles out, but I thought the field line would hold the particles. Right, so there's a process by which you can change the connection between field lines, and that process is called magnetic reconnection. So there is actually a physical process by which uh, field lines can sort of change shape very suddenly. So what you're probably looking at is a reconnection type process. There's a whole NASA mission devoted that, to that called MMS that actually operates around Earth, but it studies that same phenomena. Uh, we'll go all the way back around. Uh, behind you. Are you able to speak to, I know it hasn't even launched yet, but what's the next step for this? Because you mentioned going within two solar radii, basically as close as you could without it immediately something. What, what more do you think you could gain by getting even closer <coughs> to the crazy one shot? We'll have to find out what we can learn from, from Parker Solar Probe and how that constrains the different models and whether or not it's necessary to even go closer, whether we can decide between different models from Parker Solar Probe. The other thing that's going on at a very similar time is there's a mission from the European Space Agency called Solar Orbiter that doesn't get as close as Solar Probe, but it has many more remote sensing instruments. So Parker Solar Probe is designed kind of like a microscope. It's measuring the plasma right where the spacecraft is. But the, the European mission is taking the big picture. And the idea was to have both of them at the same time. So you'd have the ESA mission taking the big picture of the sun, and then you'd have the Parker Solar Pro being the little microscope that runs through there at the same time. So you could connect what's happening on the small scale to what's happening on the large scale. Uh, so that, that is certainly planned. Um, and what happens in the future will have to depend on what we find here. And then, okay, go ahead. Um, do you, are, is that uh, heat shield highly reflective somehow also to infrared? Or is it just using the, the strength of the material itself, or the heat strength of the material? I don't know about what's on the front. I don't think it's reflective. I'm trying to find a picture. They always show the bottom yeah, of it, right? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I can look it up for you, but I don't know it right off. I think what they're primarily doing, though, is trying to use uh, the fact that the back is black, mm -hmm. so it's a more efficient radiator, and then trying to pass the energy off to these radiators to get rid of it. Um, I think that's the primary mechanism of, of getting rid of the heat. I don't know about the front, though. Yeah, go ahead. Do they paint the, um, the heat shield white to reflect the sun? Well, that, I'm not sure. So, so that was the, the previous question. I, I'll have to look into that. And also, where are the boosters made? Oh, the boosters? Oh, yeah. The, the oh, the rocket. Boosters. Well, it's a, they got their logo on it, uh, United Launch Alliance, <laughs> are the, the folks providing all that stuff. So I, I don't know who exactly their contractors are, but ULA has an office you know, even here in Denver, but I don't think they're building the, the actual rocket here. You know, now that I think about the, the heat shield, I don't think there's a painting, like a coating on the front. And, and part of the reason I think there's no coating on the front is that they couldn't really come up with a coating that would survive those conditions. Not only the heat, but the plasma that's going to be running into it on the front would, would ablate pretty much anything you put on there. Yeah? I got a couple of questions. How do you protect the electronics or malware part? Oh, you mean from like penetrating radiation kind of things? Uh, you basically make the walls around them thicker. That's the, the basic answer. Um, the other part to it is there's a lot of uh, careful design built into the electronics. So for example, the digital electronics, the, the part that we built here, um, whenever it makes a decision, like it goes through an AND or an OR gate or anything like that, it actually does it three separate times. And it, it's like a voting 
kind of thing. So you know, best two out of three decides what the actual logical process is. Uh, and that's one way to protect against penetrating radiation. So, so the odds of three of them getting hit at the same time are pretty low. Exactly. The other question was, are there any studies being done yeah. correlating the solar wind and weather on Earth? From everything I have seen and what I understand, the solar wind itself is not going to affect weather on Earth in any meaningful way. The solar radiation would be a much more and variation in the solar radiation would be a much more uh, direct linkage between what happens on the sun and, and weather. Uh, now things like space weather, the way the Earth's magnetic field and the particles around the Earth respond, that is the solar wind. That's what drives that. I mean, the, the solar radiation affects it to the degree that it changes how the atmosphere gets ionized, but most of the short time variation is the solar wind in that case. Yeah? So you mentioned you need to calibrate, like in this picture, the motion of the vehicle, so to make accurate measurements of the magnetic field. How how do you deal with like if the solar wind is traveling so fast? How do you like determine whether you are um, making accurate measurements of the magnetic field? And electric field is a solar wind in the frame of the solar wind. Well, part of it. Um so part of it, because you'll be familiar with this answer, is that you look for alpha N waves. You look for relationships between the electric and magnetic field that depend only on the wave. And you should know the E to B ratio for, for an alpha N wave passing by. So you can make some corrections that way. Um, some other things they do is what's called a magnetometer roll. So at some points in the mission, they actually take the whole spacecraft and they rotate it about the long axis uh, very quickly and try to use that to, to um, understand offsets in the magnetometer about the spin axis. Yeah? Okay, so you show the coronal mass ejections are like, you know, dangerous to Earth a little bit. Would you say the stealth coronal mass ejections are? The what? The like, the ones that don't get much warning before happening? I mean, it depends what you mean by warning. Um, I mean, you can, you know, we have the speed of light obviously takes eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth, so if there's anything you can observe on the sun that happens in, in some wavelength of light that's related to those coronal mass ejections, you'll know about it in eight minutes. Um, the travel time is on the order of days, so part of the, part of the problem is you, you know roughly when these things leave the surface of the sun from the optical coronagraph type observations, but what you don't know is one, whether they're going to hit earth, and if they are going to hit earth, exactly when. You have a rough estimate you know, one to three days, but exactly when it happens and uh, whether it will hit Earth or go off to the side is, is a totally open question. And part of understanding how to predict that is understanding what processes on the sun lead to those sort of structures. What's the end of life on this mission? Is it going to go ah. into the sun? There's a chance. <laughs> 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 so, one thing I didn't mention, but is extremely important for this mission, is that you can't talk to it when it's close to the sun. The sun is the radio source in the solar system, is the loudest thing out there, and this, this tiny little mosquito of a spacecraft is nothing compared to the sun in terms of radio output. So you actually can't talk to it when it's between here and the sun. And in fact, Earth, you know, obviously continues its orbit around the sun, Whereas the spacecraft is doing an orbit like this. So there's actually times when the Earth is over here. You can't talk to it here. You can't talk to it out here. You're too far away. And so there, there was actually times when you go through two or three orbits without being able to talk to the spacecraft at all. And, and that's incredibly uh, challenging from an automation point of view because you need that heat shield to face the sun at all times. If it, again, two degrees off and you're dead. So that thing has to autonomously, with no human interaction whatsoever, get it exactly right every time. Um, but part of that means that when you go in real close to the sun, you can't get any information back until the spacecraft comes back away from the sun. So there's no point in crashing it into the sun because you'd never, or getting it close enough to totally melt because you'd never get the information back. You'd never know what you did. Um, so it's very unlikely that they'll, they'll choose that as an end of mission. Scenario. I was just curious where, where the jump was going to go. 
Oh, the junk. Um, it's going to be out there. It's going to you know, turn into a piece of flying debris at some point. Yeah, I mean, if you think about that, the, the Helios spacecraft, those two that the West Germany sent out, they're still there. Um, the Stereo spacecraft are both out at Earth orbit, you know, and they're, they're headed this way and that way. It's not nearly as much of a problem as the sort of near-Earth space junk that you always hear about, like sort of um, the space is much bigger <laughs> and the number of objects is much smaller uh, to the point where as long as you know where these things are and can roughly predict their orbits, it's not really an issue. What's the capacity of the recorder on the spacecraft? 32 gigabytes. That's the field's instrument. Uh, the total spacecraft, I actually don't know that number. But our, our instruments, the electric and magnetic field, uh, can hold 32 gigs. And that's good enough for two orbits. So we can record two full orbits of information before we have to start overwriting things. Presumably the spacecraft has much more than that because they have to take information from all the instruments. But not as big as you'd think. Yeah? During that time when you can't transmit, are you recording information? Then? Absolutely. And then, and then you can get that uh, data later? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, one of the problems actually on this mission is that the, the way the power goes, you only have so much power available because when you're close to the sun, you have to move those panels back to, to uh, keep them cool enough. And when you're far enough away from the sun, what they have to do is shunt all the power to the transmitter. So it's actually, as you're in this outer part of the orbit, you're only talking to Earth, doing nothing else. And then when you get into the inner part of the orbit, you turn off the transmitter and shunt all the power to the instruments so you can make your measurements. And so you're recording data all through here, and then when you get back out, you switch the power again to the transmitter and you listen to it. So yeah, it has to record and play back. And actually that was a, a huge task. Uh, what we did here at last was to design um, some very clever hardware and software to be able to record scientifically useful data and to be able to define that in real time and sort of have the spacecraft figure out what's scientifically useful before it comes back. Uh, so that was a big part of what we did here. So two more questions? Okay, so will at some point the spacecraft not have enough fuel to rotate itself and it, it will melt? Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's two systems on the spacecraft that point it. There's one called a reaction wheel, which is basically a big spinning disc inside the spacecraft that you can apply brakes to and it uh, exchanges momentum with the spacecraft to allow it to turn a little bit. Uh, but you can't spin those things up forever. Uh, you have to dump that momentum somewhere and they use thrusters to do that. And that, that is a gas thruster and eventually you'll run out of fuel. Um, but as far as I understand it, the way they size the fuel system, it'll survive well past the six years design life. If everything else survives, then the, the fuel will be just fine for a while. This is a good question. Yeah. So what do you make the antennas out of so that they don't melt in the sunshine? Niobium. So if you look on the periodic table and you find tungsten, the next one down is niobium. And it has very similar sort of temperature properties. And if you think of old style light bulbs, you know, like a filament type light bulb, that's a tungsten wire in there that gets up to incredible temperatures to produce that light uh, comparable to what will go on here. So, so yeah, the antennas are niobium and they will glow in the visible when they in the, the close approach. And that's actually a big issue because you know this thing is a, a white light imager. So we're going to be glowing in white light <laughs> as this thing is trying to image very faint signals uh, due to the, the density perturbations. So there was a whole lot of design work that involved you know, tweaking around where these antennas go and the length and the optics on this thing so that we don't interfere with each other. But yeah, it'll glow in the dark. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we're going to call that the end of the, the main section. We'll be around to answer more questions afterwards. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we'll see you again in October. I hope we have flyers up here for Parker Solar Pro. I'll collect the surveys you can leave behind. You can get to your